All right, welcome, Maker Campers. If you've been uh, watching along, I apologize for the uh, discontinuity. Um, apparently, it's one thing to, uh, to collide particles together. Uh, it's another to kind of push the boundaries of uh, live video streaming. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to go back to the top. Um, you're joining in for a Field Trip Friday. We are here talking to the team at CERN. Uh, we'll introduce them shortly. We also have Jillian and Eric joining us from the Make Labs area. Hey, How's it going, guys? <laughs> How's it going? Um, and we hopefully will be having a maker join us, um, Ben Krasnow, who uh, developed a scanning electron microscope. And towards the end of the Hangout, we'll be asking him to questions. Uh, so as always, if you have questions for the team at CERN, go ahead and write those under the post. Uh, Jillian and Eric will be taking your questions. And at the end of the Hangout, we'll have a formal Q&A uh, with the team at CERN. And so let's just go into it. Uh, we have Steve joining us. How's it going, Steve? Uh, followed by Nick. And then uh, we have Dave. And so um, Steve, why don't you go ahead and uh, kind of Take us uh, through what is CERN and what are some of the objectives and uh, what do you do? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. So, uh, my name is Steve Goldfarb. I'm a physicist and I, I actually work on the ATLAS experiment uh, on the LHC. <coughs> but I want to welcome you to CMS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, CMS is one of four very large experiments that are sitting on the Large Hadron Collider uh, at CERN. Uh, it's otherwise known as the LHC. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider is a ring about 27 kilometers around, and it's about 100 meters down below our right. feet here. Uh, and down there at CMS and at the other places, protons are smashed together at very high energies so that we can produce, well, new physics. Mm. See what, what happens when you get to very high energies. High energies <laughs> allows you to go to high masses and to look at very small things. Uh, the, the LHC is one major component of CERN. CERN is a European laboratory for particle physics. It's a laboratory that was built here uh, just outside of Geneva. We're actually on the, the French side of the border over here at CMS. Uh, it was built here in 1954, bringing together uh, scientists from all around the globe, mainly from Europe at the time, to work together uh, <laughs> on fundamental research. At the time, that research was nuclear uh, physics, but since then we've probed down to smaller and smaller and smaller. Now we're actually trying to probe things like quarks to see what's inside. Uh, it's um, it's uh, very important for us to do this this type of research uh, for a variety of reasons. And my my personal opinion is that this is something fundamental to us as human beings. Uh, I I think that we are the only species that we know of that actually is able to think beyond tomorrow. Uh, we're able to think about generations later. And we realize as a species that it's important to do fundamental research because the things that we find will affect future generations. So you guys, you young people in the camp, we might not even be doing this for you, but for your children and, and your grandchildren, the things that come out of here, uh, the discoveries that come out of here, the measurements that come out of here will be important for us to be able to do things in the future. Uh, and that's what we're here for. That's our, our number one reason. Uh, it's also important to point out, however, that a laboratory such as CERN, which brings people from, from all over the world together, uh, does a lot more than that. Uh, we produce, one of the things that you might produce, if we're a factory producing things, we produce students. We produce, we have thousands of PhD students who are coming through here uh, from all over the world and working together with the greatest technology. Now, when you put them in other people together working on the world's best technology, creating the best technology, creating the best computing, new solutions to solve problems which were <coughs> impossible a few years ago, uh, then all sorts of things pop out of it. Uh, several years ago, this young guy named Tim Berners-Lee tried to find a way to access documents for us, and he came up with something called the World Wide Web, and we think that's going to become very popular. In the future. One, <laughs> yes, one day, that will be one very day. popular. One, one day in the future. Um, uh, there, there's many other examples. Uh, the accelerator technologies that have been developed are used uh, already uh, in medical, for medical That's research. Right. And uh, in fact, I think most of the accelerators in the world now are for medical purposes. That's right. And so this work, I mean, you can imagine <laughs> things like, uh, like hadron therapy, where you, you have a, a cancerous cell in you and you can bombard that without affecting other tissues. Uh, ideas like this 
come when you put people together and they work on basic fundamental research. Uh, the detector technology is allowing us to push things forward, things like MRIs, PET scans, all of these types of things come out of having really, really great detectors. Uh, and in addition, educational methods uh, are being developed here as well. And uh, I should say sociological uh, studies have been done on the idea of having people from all over the world working together in collaborations. This is something new, and this is a, uh, something which is being studied by international uh, companies as well. How is it that these guys all get together mm -hmm. and are driven to, to, to build something uh, and come up with, with great discoveries, and we're doing this with basically a handshake? Um, so all of these, these activities uh, are occurring here, <coughs> but first and foremost is fundamental science, and we have a lot of basic questions we're trying to answer. These questions go from uh, why I'm able to pat Nick here on the back and we don't explode, right? Because I know that he's not an anti-Nick. Uh, where did the antimatter go? Uh, the universe is full of, of matter, what's left after the Big Bang. Uh, where did the antimatter go? We don't know, but it doesn't seem to be there. Why do galaxies not fall apart when they're spinning really fast? If you look at the, the matter that we can see, it's not enough to hold them together. They should never have formed. So we're missing, you think we're smart, we're missing 80% of the matter in the world. We don't know where it is. So that's something else that we're looking for. Uh, we're trying to understand the evolution of the universe. What was the universe like just after the Big Bang? 13.7 <coughs> billion years ago, there was a Big Bang. We can calculate that by looking at the shift, red shifts and, of, of the stars and all of that. Uh, what happened to it? The LHC is going to bring us back to 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang. Even from just before Dave was born. Way back then. <laughs> and, uh, so we're going way back in time. Finally, one last fundamental question we're trying to answer is, what gives mass? to particles and more this is something that recently we believe we have a view on and this is something you hear a lot about recently uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson is something which is out there we think maybe we got it and uh, you should watch to see what happens because we're going to be studying that for the next several years okay so right now what I'm going to do is I just give you a big overview here I'm going to turn over to Nick who's going to tell us a bit more about the LHC and how a large accelerator like this works right thank you Sri. so uh, this is as my friends here, Dave and Steve, they are the particle physicists who are trying to do fundamental research. But our job as a laboratory called CERN after the war was, after the Second World War, I mean, uh, was to really bring all the scientists together from Europe first uh, and build, if for peaceful purposes, accelerators. And in the, in the sense of accelerator technology and things evolved with time, we are at the latest generation, which is called the Large Hadron Collider. The Large Hadron Collider has got uh, unique issues of uh, limits of technology. Uh, it works with superconducting magnets, superconducting, but at, at using liquid helium, but not at 4.4 Kelvin, but 1.9 Kelvin, which is which makes helium, liquid helium, even more superfluid. So there's no viscosity. Uh, over 15 meter structures, we have hardly any temperature gradient, etc., etc. And the main point I'd like to say is that we talk of a collider, but I think it's first we we knew how to build accelerators, and uh, when you accelerate particle and hit a fixed target, then the energy that you produce for what you are interested to see is not the same as if you had meet head on, like. And hence, we went to the solution of having two rings, which would have two sets of particles going in opposite direction and collide head-on. That way, we increase our energy for the physics community to use our facilities. And CERN is essentially a facility where we have hundreds of universities from all over the world doing basic fundamental research in physics. The accelerator issues of the superconducting magnet, which is uh, magnets are uh, so many and multifarious in the sense that uh, I have to tell you uh, many issues that technical issues which is on the limit of technology. Yeah, the superconducting cable, we are able to put 13,000 amps in the wire. Uh, it's not just one piece of wire, it's thousands of filaments 
wound in a way at, into a flat cable, which we call Rutherford cable, and uh, the, all everything is done on the limit of uh, uh, technology and and uh, then space because we only had a, a tunnel of certain size that and the magnets with a uh, such high field like nine tesla field had to fit in so the only way out was to go superconducting this shows the cable shows the right hand side cable shows the, how it would be if we had to build a conventional magnet with the, the thickness of the cable which doesn't contain the water cooling cables and the other cable which is here all the filaments which are the super connecting cables with the bus bar uh, this is just an illustration of, of, of a model of the, the real magnet and this is the interconnection between the magnet because an accelerator of like the LHC 27 kilometers is mostly bending magnets magnets which bend the beam most of the time and at one place we have a, a uh, radio frequency system which accelerate the beam rather meaning that it gives a kick in the direction you want to go and the things go faster next time around you have to change your frequency because you've got to follow up with the faster coming beam and that's why we need a radio frequency mm -hmm. system and we need uh, this is a cross section of the superconducting magnet dipole uh, as I said there were two rings so that's the two apertures and this was each of these magnet, I mean, the whole cost of putting this magnet and the project together was uh, two billion dollars of that order. Uh, th that the, the project was four billion dollars but half was magnets which was about two billion dollars. <coughs> so it, it was a very expensive things and, and so we had to test all this equipment, all the magnets and this is the complexity of the interconnect to a test bed or test station and this is the <coughs> hole where who's, all the who's, who's there? I'm on the bike there <laughs> in the test room with uh, where all the magnets were tested over seven years. It was uh, magnets delivered by the companies. Uh, it was a, quite a big job. People working day and night, seven days a week, uh, at and through the year, just for a short break at Christmas. So it it it, it was a massive effort. It, I'm talking of fifteen to twenty years length of the project till we actually managed to come to have the beam going around in a circle first time in around 2008. Uh, so this is and since then a little bit later the improvements we are running since 2010 with uh, which is very pleasing to my friends here they're very happy and they are as, as, as you heard we come down to as close as just uh, yeah, one picosecond from the Big Bang, which you can look at it in another way. It's very, we create that condition closer to the Big Bang, as close, that's the limit. We need to go even to high energies, but that's another game on building new colliders and new accelerators. And uh, we <coughs> we need to do that, of course, because as, as Steve said, it is science, progress in science and fundamental nature of things. It, it's, it's, it's our human nature to discover things and it's from the day Newton saw an apple falling from the tree or as everybody knows uh, the quest for knowledge uh, doesn't go away so this will continue and we we continue to a help in this by building accelerators and CERN uh, with his series of accelerators from a linear accelerator to a circular ring and then we use the same ring to feed the next ring we have a series of accelerators. We have a four-mile machine called the SPS, which is normal conducting, not superconducting. The beauty of our latest machine called the LHC is that we work at 1.9 Kelvin, which is colder than the temperature of the universe, which is the universe is around 2.3 Kelvin. Uh, we have uh, we are we were the first ones to build uh, an accelerator magnet with two apertures at the same in the same structure so to save money and the size and uh, to fit into a tunnel which we had built for other purposes earlier so we it was a saving of all that issues of money and and with with all the European countries paying for that we also are very conscious of how we spend the taxpayers money uh, taxpayers money in the sense of doing fundamental physics which is pleases a wide range of community in, uh, in the whole world 
which is what we've become. We're now a world lab uh, with a number of people who are here from all over the world. and uh, Even the U.S.? Even, even, even the U.S. Even U.S. Even US. We <laughs> even tolerate the U.S., yes. Uh, <laughs> tolerate. <laughs> tolerate is a key word. But <laughs> 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 now, but the uh, final part, I think the U.S. outnumbers all the rest of the European countries in numbers of physicists at CERN at the moment. Uh, but then, uh, you know, U.S. has uh, had a accelerators as well, and uh, in the old days, uh, Europeans used those facilities, so it's, it's normal that uh, our friends from the other side of the pond uh, come and use our facilities because we are the leaders in the world at the moment. Uh, till somebody builds something bigger and better uh, on the other side. So um, back to accelerators and uh, as I said, I can keep on talking about accelerators, but, but perhaps that's the right moment to pass the message and pass hand over to my friend Dave here, who is going to tell you all about the CMS. Uh, we are sitting in the control room of, of one of the very large detectors where the two beams collide and, and these collisions uh, uh, even though the particles are, the, the beam size, let me just tell you, just as an analogy, is one third of my hair. The cross section is 15 microns, and an average human hair is of the order of 45 or something like that. So it, it, we're talking of that size beam with a lot of energy in that beam uh, at that uh, where we operate it, and so we have to be very careful with a lot of equipment there and uh, it would cost us a big uh, incident if we have an accident. So there are a lot of precautions, a lot of safety, a lot of security. I don't mean human safety, I mean safety for our equipment. And all that is taken into account in our, uh, this, this structure. So, and uh, David will now tell you a little bit more about how they are achieving their aims by going to this either in terms of picoseconds or in terms of uh, high temperatures, hotter than the sun. Uh, later. <laughs> <laughs> so as uh, Steve introduced, there are two parts to CERN really. There's the accelerator that Nick has told you all about that makes the particles go faster and faster before bringing them into collision. And then where the particles collide, we try and build something that looks like a, a, a big digital camera in effect. And we're in the control room of one of those big digital cameras. Uh, Steve would say it's a small one, in fact. Uh, called, because his is bigger. Cute. Yeah, his, cute. his is bigger, though, yeah. So <laughs> this, this is the, uh, the... No, we won't say that. So uh, this is the control room of the compact muon solenoid. So it's one of four really big detectors, experiments, built around this 27-kilometer uh, ring of the LHC. Uh, and the job here is to try and see what happens in the collisions, and see if there was something interesting made, like uh, a new particle, such as the Higgs boson. Now, the, one of the problems is that the probability of creating something new, something interesting, is extremely small. So we have to collide, or our friends from the LHC have to collide uh, these protons extremely often. And at the moment, they're colliding them about 20 million times every second. Uh, in a couple of years' time, they'll up the game a bit and go to about 40 million times every second. That's right. But this is actually not the total number of collisions. It's just the number of times that proton bunches pass through each other or go around the ring and hit each other. Each bunch of protons contains 10 to the power 11 uh, protons inside this bunch. And on average, we get around 20 to 30 of these protons colliding every time. The job of the detector is then to try and figure out what happened. And CMS is uh, yeah, compact, it's small. <laughs> it's only about 14,000 tons. Uh, it's 21 meters long, 15 meters diameter. So compact is a little bit of a misnomer sometimes. They think it's small. It's, it's not small. It, it's relatively small. So Atlas, uh, on the other hand, is much bigger. It's about double every dimension except the weight. It's about yeah, half the weight. So they're the light it's lightweight. lightweight. Um, yeah. <laughs> but the job of both of our devices is roughly the same. It's to try and see whatever's there. If the Higgs boson exists, and we now kind of think it does exist, okay. yeah. um, <laughs> we, we detect it. If supersymmetry, which might explain all this dark matter in the universe, exists, we'll detect it. And, and both of our detectors will do that. 
we have two detectors uh, because unlike experiments when, you, when you're at school, no one knows the answer to what we're doing. So if we see something and they don't see anything, we can be pretty sure that at least one of us has um, screwed up somewhere. If you both see it in the same place, you can be pretty sure that you've got the physics spot on. And with this uh, announcement that we had recently about the Higgs, both experiments saw it in roughly the same place with roughly the same significance I, the amount of signal we saw. So we're pretty confident that we've seen something real now. Uh, these detectors we can tell you about later in a bit more detail. Uh, they're essentially divided into layers. They're very large devices that try to determine all of the particles that came out of a collision to try and measure properties of those, identify what they were, where they went, uh, in order to be a bit like detectives to figure out what happened in the initial collision. The reason for that is something like the Higgs boson, you'll never see it directly. The Higgs boson decays. It turns into something else almost immediately uh, so that it doesn't travel a, an appreciable distance. So you'll never see a direct signal for this thing. So what we see are the, the decay products, the things it's turned into somewhere in our detector. So we have to trace back and say, ah, looks like there was something interesting happened there. <laughs> I mentioned at the beginning that this is like a big uh, digital camera. And in fact, CMS is it's only 75 megapixels, which, oh, that's all. which isn't, <laughs> isn't a great deal these days. You know, my phone has five. <laughs> so you could say, well, it's only like having 15 phones, which mm -hmm. isn't a big deal, really. You could probably count that in this room. The difference is this camera takes 40 million pictures every second uh, in three dimensions as well. So it's a little bit of a different scale to the, the sort of thing that you might be used to going to the local supermarket to pick up. Uh, and of course, we can't store 40 million pictures every second. We have to throw away most of them. And most of them, most of the collisions that these guys provide us with are, are garbage, unfortunately. <laughs> they could try harder, but you know, mostly garbage. We do. And it's only on a rare occasion that there's something interesting. So we have to make sure we select those interesting things and throw away all the rest. And we can store, I think Atlas is roughly the same, a few hundred mm -hmm. of these pictures every second. Uh, but even that is a phenomenal amount of data. So we can essentially fill one CD every second. Uh, and then, of course, we have to analyze all of that data. And we've been running now for a couple of years. A couple of years, yeah. Um, taken a huge amount of data, and we're still sifting through it to find all the interesting stuff. So far, the most interesting is, of course, the, the Higgs boson. But we should also note that the, this experiment lasts for a long time. So we started two years ago. It's going to go on for another eight or so years in its present kind of configuration. The LHC energy is going to increase. Frequency of crossing the particles is going to increase. But roughly doing the same <laughs> sort of thing. We've accumulated until now a, a few percent of the total amount of data that we're going to get by about 2022, 23. So it's a long-term experiment, uh, very different from what you do at school. And on each of these big experiments on Atlas, sorry, I'm CMS, this guy's <laughs> Atlas. Um, on each of our experiments, there's more than about 3,500 scientists and engineers from all around the world. So this is a, a massive worldwide collaboration that's different from virtually everything else around the world. Uh, Final thing I want to show you in my segment is um, this machine, the CMS detector, uh, is 100 meters below us now. It costs uh, to build about half a billion dollars, and we're in the control room now. So I'm going to take you on a very quick tour through the control room so you can see how difficult it is to actually control this thing. So it's not, it doesn't look quite like NASA. Uh, in fact, we only need five people to control this whole object, which is, I think, quite amazing. Uh, so we have the shift leader, who's like the boss. He's in charge of everything that goes on here. Uh, and he's in constant contact with the LHC control room to find out what's happening at all times. 
uh, and make sure that everything here is working as it should do. We then have on this side of the room a much bigger area. This is actually the safety and, and control area. So, of course, safety of this whole apparatus for people and for the machine itself is of paramount importance. There are many different things to control, like the environmental conditions, make sure that all the power supplies of this massive piece of apparatus are all working in harmony or all doing what they should do. Uh, so safety is obviously a big, big issue and uh, nothing ever has gone wrong, which is great. Over here, we have a uh, shifter that's responsible for taking the data, for making sure that all the layers in CMS are singing in harmony. They're doing what they should do and taking the data, which is great. Uh, and then here is a big responsibility, which is I mentioned about selecting the right data, the right collisions. And here is called the trigger. So you determine here which of the many events you actually take. Uh, and then finally, over here, we have a thing called the data quality monitoring, which is <coughs> making sure the data coming from the detector are all good. Now, we can tell everything's working very well by looking at these screens here, for example. So right now, right at this moment in time, the LHC is colliding protons. And those protons are colliding in CMS, and in Atlas, in ALICE, LHCB. And here you can see a sort of pictorial display of those collisions. And you'll see it change in just a, a few moments. Uh, we just monitor one every few seconds. We don't look at all of them, obviously, by, by eye. Um, so you can see collisions happening right now, right as we speak. So it's quite an exciting place to be, but it's um, still amazing to me that just five people control this whole operation. Uh, of course, we change those five people uh, three times a day, but the, the whole thing works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, when the, whenever the LHC is operating. So that's the quick tour of CMS control room done. Unfortunately, we can't go underground. Uh, when the LHC is operating, there's no access to the experiments. We can't see that. Maybe you come back next year when uh, everything's opened up, and then we can actually go down and see the experiment. So that's it for now. Thank you. We hand over to the other side of the Atlantic. <laughs> Great. Thank you for the uh, for the tour. Um, I think we'll go into some questions now, if uh, if you're ready. Um, so I was going to ask, uh, yeah. maybe I can start with Nick. Um, with this project, the Lord Hadron Collider, will you be constantly updating components and adding on new parts? Or now that it's built, um, do you stay with the current configuration and run the experiment for the next several years? No. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, it took, let's say, we're working with design, which was... Uh, uh, 20, 15, 20 years old, and we we uh, were at the limit of technology. However, and and we've just started, meaning we have run, they have taken data for two years, or useful data. Uh, so uh, a lifetime of such an accelerator with the amount of money that we have spent, it, it, it will at least be another 20 years before we talk of changing dramatically. In between, we will change things, let's say around uh, <coughs> time scale of around 2022, 20, 23. Uh, we hope where the detectors are built, where the beams, two beams collide, those super focusing quadruples, I think they will come to the end of their lifetime. Uh, these quadruples, incidentally, were built by the Americans and the Japanese collaboration. That was part of their contribution to our project. So at every interaction point, there's a mirror image. These three quadruples on each side are were built by the Americans. So these are going to be replaced maybe in on the time scale of year two, ten years from now. And then uh, any other thing is needs uh, really a, a jump in technology, which we don't know. We are doing R and D on. Uh, research and development on work, things like um, new type of superconducting material, uh, which would, uh, instead of using niobium titanium, which we use for the fire today, we, we will go to niobium tin, maybe double the intensity of the, of the strength of the magnet. Instead of 9 Tesla, we can go up to 20 Tesla. All, all these sort of things are open-ended issues, and of course, it needs uh, 
<laughs> we one needs to build magnets again uh, and the cost issue so it, it's a long term issue but for the moment the answer is yes we go through the technology challenges and improving but uh, we have to justify uh, a big leap till we arrive at uh, that sort of uh, i think i think yeah great julian and eric do you want to ask uh, some questions from the campers or some questions on your own yeah, we got a great question from Camper Richard, who wants to know what stuff existed before the Big Bang, and what was that stuff inside of? What stuff existed Steve. before the before the Big Bang? Oh, that's so a you're, tough question. you're implying that that I was around then. Yeah, yeah. you must have seen. <laughs> from your own personal <laughs> recollection, please. My own personal <laughs> recollection. I don't remember much from before the Big Bang. <laughs> uh, we we um, it doesn't make sense actually uh, for us to talk about. Uh, the existence of things before the yeah. Big Bang. We, ha we have very few things that we hold on to. We have to have very st uh, strong imaginations in our field uh, because we're going to the extremes. Uh, human beings are built uh, of a certain size and we go a certain speed, uh, relatively slow compared to most particles and things like that. So it took people with you know brilliance like uh, Albert Einstein uh, to, to, to imagine, hey, what's it like to go, you know, close to the speed of light or speed of light or Niels Bohr to come up with a solution for why, you know, an atom doesn't collapse on itself. People had to think differently. Um, and so we're allowed to think really differently and to imagine. And you're welcome to, you know, imagine the universe before the, the Big Bang. Uh, however, what's, what's really important for us is, is um, probability. We have to hold on to causality. Everything has to be able to, uh, to, to to not have infinities for us to do our calculations. It's one of the few things we hold on to. And uh, when we uh, look at the data that we have, we look at the way the universe is accelerating, we trace everything back uh, to a Big Bang that happened at a specific time. And uh, all of the evidence that we have so far indicates that would be the beginning of everything. There were no, you know, there were no rules and suddenly all the rules of physics came out and from that time onward. It doesn't really, it's, it's a mind game to try to understand what would have happened before the Big Bang. It doesn't really make sense. You have to, what you really need is, to, is we need to, to wheel Stephen Hawking in here. I think. Well, in fact, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the thing is time began yeah. so, at the Big Bang. <laughs> at T equal to so, zero. So there, there was no time before that. But yeah, I think we should leave you on that. Yeah, we'll be, yeah. Note. <laughs> before we walk off the deep end. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, here's another good one. Brooklyn wants to know, is it difficult to stay objective when doing research like this? How do you prevent yourself from being attached to a particular result? Okay, um, maybe I can yeah, answer right. that. So give an example there. Um, a at the end of 2011, both Atlas and CMS uh, started to see some signal that could have been due to the presence of this Higgs boson. Uh, so we knew that the only way to clarify whether this was a real signal or not was to take more data and analyze it, of course. Uh, but we didn't want to bias ourselves. So what we did for the next six, seven months was do something called a blind analysis where we developed the algorithms to look for the Higgs boson in various ways that we could look for it. But we never looked at the results mm -hmm. uh, because we, we thought, well, maybe we'll, we'll be biased. We'll want to see a, a bigger signal around this place uh, and not look everywhere else. You know, so we, we did this blind analysis. And we, just a, about a month and a half ago, we did this thing called Open in the Box which was essentially now looking at the results. And that was a, a fantastic event. I, I, of course, being from CMS, I wasn't allowed in to see yeah. the box opening for Atlas and vice versa. But what happened in CMS was it was young PhD students who presented the results of this opening. And it was uh, incredibly emotional for a lot of people there. I mean, there was you know, several hundred people watching this and seeing the results for really the first time. So we weren't biased. We, we saw them then and there. And uh, I remember one girl in particular, she, sh she started showing her slides and she said, I'm incredibly nervous. And then she stopped on one slide and she said, are you ready for this? Are you ready for the next slide? Because it was essentially only her that had seen the result. 
and she put it over and there was a, this big peak showing something. So yes, ob objectivity is incredibly important and we strive to do that all the time. <coughs> yeah. It's also objective because we have two competing, if you like, experiments. Yeah, it was, I can say the same thing happened for Atlas. Uh, and this was about one week or so before a major, the major conference. Yeah. A, a conference that happens every every two years is a summer conference, although it was in Melbourne, Australia, <laughs> so it was actually winter. But uh, just, you know, just before that conference, we opened up this box. So we, it could have been that we were going to go to the conference to say, well, we don't have anything, which would have been fine. That was good physics yeah. if we didn't have anything. But in fact, we saw that. And then what was, you know, there was that set of emotions, but then we'd never seen the CMS results. CMS had never seen ours. Yeah. And so live on the air, uh, in front of many, many people, uh, we had a webcast of the, of the unveiling of each one, each one presenting to each other their results. And our spokespersons uh, each spoke. I think so, so Atlas got to be excited first because CMS gave the first talk. Yeah. So we, we got to see that CMS had a signal at the exact same place that, that uh, Atlas had it. So it was a very emotional and, and mm. powerful time. And so you guys were both working on the same research at the same time, and you had you had determined a, a date in the future that you'd both unveil your boxes. Yeah. So it wasn't a race. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was a little bit of a race in a well, a race against time rather than against each other. So as Steve said, there was this conference coming up, which was the biggest one that we have in our field, and you want to be able to present something at that conference, but you have to be very careful. You don't want to present something before you're really sure that you understand everything about what went into that analysis. Because you really don't want to stand up and say, yes, we found something, and then the next day go, ah, we found a, a loose cable in something <laughs> that, um, yes, we won't go into that. Yeah. Well, so Dave, can I kind of follow up with that then? Um, I've been reading about kind of the, the sigma numbers, how, how sure you are of these results. Can you go into what the significance is and how that kind of works with, how do you know you found something unique and new or that you're confident in the results? Um, so first thing is we, everything we look for uh, has what's called a background. There are other things that can look like it. So uh, one example is this famous Higgs particle can decay into two photons. And that's a very nice signal. It's very easy for us to see in CMS. Uh, pretty easy in Atlas as well. <laughs> and, uh, but there are other things. There are other sort of what we call standard model processes where protons collide and can also produce two photons. Don't come from a Higgs, but just come from this interaction of two protons. So the first thing we have to do is model the background. We have to understand the background extremely well. And uh, we've both put, both experiments have put in a lot of effort to do that. So you get this sort of picture of how the background looks. So it's like looking at a landscape, in fact. Uh, and then what you really want to see on this nice flat desert plain is a nice mountain sticking up. And the higher the mountain, the more sure you are that it's a mountain and it's not a molehill. So <laughs> we, we have a measure for that, which is the, the background can sort of fluctuate. It move, there are places where it gets higher and lower. So this background fluctuation, um, the amount that it fluctuates, we call a sigma. That's one standard deviation, how much it moves. To claim a discovery, what we, we impose ourselves, actually, mm -hmm. is we say, well, the signal, the mountain that we see above this flat landscape should be at least five times the average fluctuation of the background. Uh, if you do that, the chances of the background just doing something crazy um, is one in some number of million that... Three million, three some million. Three million. Three million. So, three million or something, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Um, probably got the numbers wrong, so don't quote us on that, but some huge number. <laughs> so the probability is incredibly small. Uh, so this is the, the sigma value, the standard deviation. We want to be sure that we're in a number of sigma above the background. And we've both seen signals that are more than five sigma above the background. And the fact that both of us see this Higgs signal in the same place with this significance, uh, you can be pretty sure it's real. I'm pretty sure. I, I, was, I, I would just think that to say that 
in, in pointing this out, they've mentioned one of the things that's really amazing about our field. And, and that's this, that we get to play with these things like quantum mechanics. We see it in real <laughs> life. And Nick gets to play all the time with E equals MC squared. Yep. He's always taking E and giving us MC squared. And uh, <laughs> we get to see quantum mechanics because we see, we know what goes in, we know what went in, and we know what came out. When, you know, we measure, we have our detector there to see what came out. But we're never allowed, they, neither Dave nor I are allowed to see exactly what happened in the middle of this. Uh, event when when something was created and, and disappeared, and so we only by these statistical mm. methods mm. can actually say we found something. When somebody shows you a picture of an event and they say this is a Higgs event from CMS, you now know better than just to, to believe them. You'll say no, yep. it's wrong. Uh, it could be a Higgs event. It's a candidate, yeah. but it could also be background because you'll you never know exactly what happened in the middle. So yeah. that's a fun bit of our work. Well, I think we have a lot of questions from the campers watching. So, Jen and Eric, do you want to ask a few more? Yeah. Um, we've got a question. Do you want to ask that one? Mm -hmm. yep. <coughs> All right. Lorraine wants to know, <laughs> a few days ago it was announced that the LHR hit 5.5 trillion degrees, the highest temperature ever produced. How does that compare to the temperature of the sun, and can the LHR hit an even higher number? Uh -huh. Collisions uh, uh -huh. even higher than the temperature. Yeah, I, in, in, well, so yeah, yeah, I mean, it's um, it's quite weird, really. I mean, Nick was talking earlier about how cold the magnets are, yeah. and they're colder than outer space. It's the coldest place in the universe, mm -hmm. um, apart from some other small labs around the world. Yeah. Um, but conversely, when the particles collide, the energy is such that the equivalent temperature is it's more than a billion times That's hotter right. than the center sun. of the sun. Yeah. Wow. So, so this is it's, it's, it's pretty warm. Um, <laughs> but contained within this, th that temperature is contained within something that's 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So it's, it's a very weird place yeah. to be. Um, fortunately, that temperature only lasts you know, a tiny, tiniest fraction of a second, and it's very localized in space into the tiniest volume you can possibly imagine. So there's no danger at all. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just interesting to think in that way that it's you know, a billion times hotter than the center of the sun. Sure. And I, and I think, I think that, that that number, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know if that's protons or that's heavy ion collisions. Because recently, there, I think there was just a news yeah. article about the heavy ion collisions. That came out because there's a conference that went on this week, uh, Quark Matter, uh, it, which is in Washington, D.C.? Yes. Is that right? And uh, there we're seeing the results uh, the, of the analysis of data when we collide heavy ions. Because Nick can do more than just protons. <laughs> yeah, can... we, do, we do heavy ions. We, yeah, we, we, and we do do that. Uh, we do lead ions, uh, collisions. We, we're going to do it next year, beginning of next year, for, for you guys uh, for six weeks up to 11th of February. And then we're going to stop for nearly two years. Um, uh, no, talking back about the temperature of the sun, and uh, you, you, one has to look at the, you, you look at it in time time scale. We say Big Bang happened 14 billion years ago. You can look at it in the temperature scale. That when the Big Bang happened, it was extremely hot. It was hotter than the sun. Uh, and you can look at also in terms of uh, distances, in terms of how small we are talking about. It. So. Uh, if you if you put all these things, this is why I mentioned the fact that uh, it was the, the the collisions that we try to re we are approaching or trying to recreate the conditions of the Big Bang mm -hmm. for physics, and their job is to approach as close as we can do with the best of our ability with our collisions, mm -hmm. and to see and create. So if you if you look at the chart, which are well published uh, charts are available, it shows how how life began in, in a way. You could say, you know, you, you had all the individual elements and uh, uh, how finally, it, uh, pr presently, the universe from the Big Bang to today, we are much cooler than at that time at the Big Bang. Very cool. We're, we're very, cool. We're, we're, cool. Cool. we're, we're, we're very, very cool. cool. Yeah. I, I, I should take, I, just have one, I know there's a lot of questions, but I, want, I think one moment to just mention that uh, one of the experiments, we've mentioned the Atlas and CMS. There's a couple other very important experiments 
slightly smaller. But, yeah, you know, we're still, still smaller. Still you know, big. We're yeah. we're three thousand, three thousand five hundred uh, members a piece, and they're around a thousand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're Alice and LHCB. Now Alice is specifically designed, designed to measure this ion. environment. So That's they right. they look at heavy ions and. That's and right. They're and the they, stars in Washington. And, and they're, they're yeah. going into the aspect of quark, gluon, plasma, and that sort of esoteric stuff, which I don't know enough about. But sure. So okay. they're really, really studying the, the <laughs> early universe. And then LHCB is, is trying to answer the, the question about anti matter and antimatter, yeah. what happened right. to the antimatter by exactly. studying uh, B particles. So just to complete the picture. Okay. Sorry to, sorry to use the time. More questions. Give us a question. Oh, that's perfectly fine. What, what do you know about matter and antimatter? Why, why don't you guys explode when you touch each other? What well, well let's try it. Let's try it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what we know is that um, everything that we can see in the universe is matter. We don't see any antimatter. That's the problem, in fact. Uh, so the, the theory of the Big Bang says that everything was equal. Everything was equal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You had an equal amount of matter and antimatter. And we know from watching Star Trek that. If you know matter and antimatter were to meet, or Tom Hanks was to meet with an anti-Tom Hanks, then you'd get a big <laughs> explosion and uh, go into pure energy. Uh, fortunately, there must have been some sort of imbalance right at the beginning of time, uh, because we're here. Mm. So if, if there was no imbalance, the universe wouldn't exist. Uh, so we wouldn't be sitting here now doing this maker camp. So we know a bit about antimatter. We know how it behaves in some senses. We can make it in the lab or make some parts of it in the lab. But we don't know why there isn't any in, in naturally existing in the universe. That's one of the big open questions. That's true. Sure. Sure. And I think LHCB tries to study this. And we also try to study this as well by looking at a phenomenon we call CP violation. But they, they, the basic idea is that perhaps there are certain particles which decay preferentially to matter than to antimatter. Yeah. And they, they look at B quarks and now also C quarks because they may have a behavior which, which tends to create matter. And, and what you should keep in mind is that at the Big Bang, if you count up all the, the matter and antimatter, there would have been a lot more. So it's, right. it's like we're just sort of the leftovers. Yeah. With a little bit that's left over, there was a lot more stuff beforehand and all that's left is this little bit of matter. <laughs> and actually there's another experiment that was, that was constructed here at CERN, but is now up over our heads in the International Space Station called AMS. Mm -hmm. And AMS is out there actually looking for sources of exactly. antimatter, among other things, and looking to see if there are big gamma rays coming from different places in the universe. Yeah. So, any other questions? Any other so questions? we have a question from Christopher. And um, going back to all your, when you were giving a tour of your lab, um, I know it's like all the different monitors and it must be kind of, is it kind of information overload or is it um, to having to view all those monitors at once or is there just like certain areas where you could just so, focus on? So most things are extremely automated uh, and very simple because you're right, there's a lot of screens, there's a lot of information on the screens, there's a lot of displays. Um, but what we, what we have is that uh, most things you may have seen are green. And green means good, uh, funnily enough. And <laughs> when things do go wrong, like, for example, a power supply that provides the voltage to one of our detectors might go down, it might trip, just like in your house, something might happen. Uh, when that happens, a green light will change to a red light. So it it's becomes extremely obvious. If there's something really serious goes wrong, like more than one, <coughs> one of these power supplies. Then you might get an audible alarm as well. Mm. So things are a lot simpler than they look, um, but there are a lot of screens around you. Yeah. Yeah, like to look, yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. How would someone get a job at CERN? Yeah, tell us. <laughs> tell me, you guys. Because you guys seem I, fun to hang out with. <laughs> you know, there's a mix of people here, I should say, uh, because uh, I'm, I'm what's called a user. I've been using this place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a second class citizen. They, they, take good, they take good care of me. I'm a second class citizen. Not really. Um, I come from the University of Michigan, actually, and I've been over here since 1988, working on, uh, worked on first on LEP and now on, on the LHC. 
Uh, and, but I, I don't actually work for CERN. I work for my institution. And my mm -hmm. institution um, takes part in different experiments. I've actually worked at several different universities. But uh, they, they, they participate. And uh, in a sense, uh, uh, you can think of it, uh, so our colleague Claudia likes to use this example, which I think is a good one, is that CERN is kind of like, a, um, like an airport, uh, providing an infrastructure, and people mm. who work at the airport. Uh, and, and I'm one of these guys on one of the uh, airlines, uh, working in a structure of an airline. So it's a different kind of uh, structure. And um, so, so I am sort of come from that point of view. So I came over here, I snuck in. I'm not, I don't get my paycheck from, from CERN, but I get it from, from the university. Uh, now maybe you can tell us uh, how one gets a, gets a job coming into the yeah. front door. Well, there are also different, very different levels as well that you can come in at. Um, unfortunately, it's late in the day here now on Friday. Um, for all of this week, I've actually been hosting two uh, young people that came from the UK. They're 17 and 18 years old. And they essentially just wrote to CERN and said, can, can we come to CERN and uh, follow someone around for a week and see what they do? Uh, I was then contacted and said, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll take them both during this one week. And that was their first insight into CERN and their first foot in the door, if you like. And they're going to go off and finish their studies at school and hopefully go to university and study physics next year. Um, so that's like a first way in that you can do. You can just come and visit uh, and see what happens. Second level is when you do a degree at university uh, and then a PhD, normally in physics, but not exclusively by any means. I mean, we have a lot of engineers <coughs> here. We have a lot of computer scientists here. Uh, we have a lot of administration here as well. So we have a lot of different fields here that you can do part of your studies based here at CERN. As a postgraduate student, you might sure. spend two, three years based That's here. Right. Easily, yeah. So there's, there's that level as well. And then there's after that when you're someone who chooses that this is the career that you actually want to follow, then you either work for a university like Steve or you can... Uh, get a job actually at CERN, and I was one of the fortunate ones many years That's ago right, when there were yeah. a few jobs available at CERN, and I got a job here, and I, I've in fact been working on this experiment ever since I got a job at CERN, mm -hmm. which is kind of frightening, mm -hmm. because <laughs> it's longer than the, the two young people I hosted this week have been alive. <laughs> so I've been working on CMS for 18 years, uh, and I'm not bored of it yet either. No. I still think it's great. So there, there are different ways of yeah, getting in, different levels of coming in. Yeah, I mean, I could add uh, something more, a little bit more details. That, uh, of course, I, I've been here much longer than him, but uh, since the big uh, bang, but, yeah. Yeah, yeah, almost. <laughs> like the big bang. I, in fact, I worked on the antimatter business, so anti, you know, using antiprotons, so for a previous generation of collider experiments. So, uh, anyway, back to the issue of the type of people here. We have uh, the core group of CERN people are the engineers, technicians, even physicists, accelerator physicists, who built facilities mm. to provide the beams for physics. That's our, our sort of motto and uh, our goal. And um, so that, of course, that's a profession. And you, you, you grow with it. CERN would uh, you try and get a job uh, doing that. And the other a rare commodity is a physicist employed by CERN itself. Mm. They are very rare and very, very few in number. And But the majority are people who are coming from different universities, like Steve here, who mm. come to use the facilities here. So mm. uh, Now back to the other question of how, you, as, as young people, you lot, uh, we have uh, even summer student uh, mm. schemes where people come just for July, August. Mm. Uh, I know that it's not open. Uh, we, we are a European institution, so it's limited more or less to Europe, plus some exceptions, uh, uh, new member countries coming in. 
Uh, it, it depends on, on the, even the physics experiment. They probably can take people from any country. Yeah, like. I think because because we've run the program. I'm, I'm always yeah. one of the exceptions. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, they, they, so they, have, they have schemes they can take people from because they, well, their collaboration is, 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 you know, CERN pays only 20% for that and 80% <laughs> comes from universities. So they can do what, what they like. Well, we, we actually made, yeah, I should <laughs> say that, yeah. that uh, for those of you in, in the U.S., if you're, if you're interested, uh, the National Science Foundation funds the uh, research experience for undergraduates program. It's an REU summer student program. And we send uh, 15 students uh, over here every every summer. We have about 250 applicants, but we send 15 students uh, yeah, over here. Go. They just they just flew back home yeah. last yeah. week. Uh, they have an <laughs> incredible time. You have to be a junior uh, at a university, uh, but you know it's it's never too late to you know think about doing something like that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we're we're invest because of the huge demand. There's a big demand for students. Uh, and there's a big demand by students to come over here. That's right. We're actually looking into making a program which would go out through the, the school year. So try to bring uh, yeah. over students during the, during the semester. So that's being investigated. And hopefully we'll get started a pilot project in the next year or so. And then Steve, can you, uh, can you blow me to the top of the list? <laughs> yeah, well, you just have to apply. You just have sure. to apply. Sorry, Nick, I interrupted you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, I was going to ask as well. Um, Maybe each of you could talk about this. Where do you see the future of these sorts of projects going? And um, just more experimenting and, and team collaboration. It seems like we've kind of gotten away from a single person working in a lab by themselves to come up with a theory and sort of prove that theory um, to these just huge, huge collaborations. Um, is that the future of all research, you think? Or are these large projects you know, just the product of we're whittling down to the fundamentals here? Philosophical question. Who wants to come? <laughs> well, well the f give your opinion. Okay, <laughs> I mean, the, difficult our, our field, I think, is very different from many others. Uh, it's perverse in a way to think that we to find the the smallest things in the universe, we have to use some of the biggest equipment, and the no one country could actually afford to build either in money or in manpower terms the equipment that we need for this research. So particle physics is kind of necessarily big, big science, uh, worldwide science. Having said that, it, this Higgs particle that we've uh, come to know and love, that was postulated by one person nearly 50 years ago following a, uh, a theory, a mechanism that was actually developed to give particles mass that was developed by six people. So if you like, this, this whole search for the Higgs boson came from six people nearly 50 years ago. So it was almost small science, a few people coming up with a theory. Uh, but then led to tens of thousands of people working on it over the next few decades. Uh, I don't, my personal view is I don't think many other scientific fields are like ours. I think space explor exploration is, is another one. Uh, again, for financial reasons more than anything, uh, but there are lots that are not like that. So maybe Steve yeah. and Nick can yeah. add to that. Yeah, I, I would say that, yeah, the same. Uh, that uh, of course, you know, as you go to fundamental research, that means you're looking at stuff you've never looked at before, and so that naturally means by now, since we've already been doing science for mm. several hundred years. That it's looking at the extremes, whether it's you know going out into space far, looking bigger and bigger telescopes, or looking with bigger and bigger microscopes uh, yeah. to look in small. The technology gets more and more specialized. It becomes expensive, um, and uh, so it takes a big group of people to 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 make it work. Um, it's I, I should note, you know, we've mentioned that the price because uh, because it is it is very important. We take it very seriously. The our our effort. Um, it's something, because of the amount of people involved in this project, it comes out to nearly a, a, a cup of coffee uh, per person uh, per year uh, in, 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 in taxes. Per European, <laughs> per European, European, yeah, yeah. Per European so, population. So it's, yeah. it's, it's actually, considering that you have 10,000 people over 20 years working on the project, uh, yes, if you add it all up, it's a lot. But for research, it's actually a pretty... Pretty good. Uh, it's a, a good investment. A lot of big bang for the buck. Yeah. Uh, I like to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, but but these projects, I, I do see. You know, it's. I, I should say it's fun. 
even though I'm yeah. working with, with 3,000 people, it changes what I do. And nothing prevents me from getting my name known. So even though I'm in this big group and I get to work as a team, which I find fun. I always like team sports. Um, I think that, that working as a team is a lot of fun. I can still be the person who solves how to improve the resolution in our detector enough that you can suddenly see a, a signal where you didn't see one before. Uh, you know, there's, there's a <clears throat> lot of room to become a hero, as there is on any sort of team. Yeah. And everybody is in a sort. Everyone is sort of a specialist in different areas. There's people who are just gurus in electronics, and they're pushing the fields of electronics That's right. forever. People who are gurus in cryogenics, okay. uh, in, in computing. computing. Uh, uh, yeah, the compute. We haven't even mentioned the, the the challenges of computing that have gone on here. The the, the development of the of the LHC, the the, the compute, the worldwide grid, which was mm -hmm. necessary to make to to actually do the computations that we do here. That's and, you know, right. we yeah. we gave up. CERN CERN could not handle the LHC. That's right. So we distributed around the world. Exactly. Yeah, so with, with, uh, yeah literally with, with modern communications, with the data gets sent to all the universities via certain centers all over the world and uh, it, it gets analyzed there at home. Yeah, the, the vast, by the vast, right. vast majority. Yeah, that's so, right. so we have huge tools, it's true. Huge tools, big collaborations working on things, but you can still have a hero in there and you can still, you know, do something small. You have small groups in there yeah. who do specialize oh, yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. And that's our field. And that's what our field probably, I, I would guess, it's going to continue somewhat in that direction. Now, as you get to other specialized things, you know, as you go from more fundamental research towards more specialized research, then teams tend to yeah. perhaps get smaller. And so there's a whole world out. If you go into science, you're, you're going to find any range. But uh, all things. permutations of both, yeah. 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 I think, well, just to pick up on one thing that Steve said, was, is it's important to note that whatever level you're at when you're working in this field, you're listened to. So from the, from the new graduate student to the director general, people listen to you. So if you have a, an idea, you have a point to make, you have a new way of doing something, people will always listen to you, regardless of, you know, there being three and a half thousand others. So every one of you yeah. makes sort of your own little bump above the background. Hmm. Great. Well, um, do you want to make any last comments, uh, Dave, Nick, or Steve, before we uh, kind of wrap things up? Is that a good note yeah. to end on? Well. Very theoretical. <laughs> <laughs> well, this, this has been a lot of fun being in summer camp. It's, it's been a while yeah, since yeah. I went to summer camp. I was yeah. never in a summer camp before. Yeah. So. so it's great. So thank you, you counselors, for putting putting this together. And um, you know, I would say to to anybody uh, who's watching, you know, this is keep keep your eyes peeled. Uh, both uh, Dave and I spent a lot of time uh, putting the message out there. We're both uh, the the education and outreach uh, coordinators for our experiments. So we're, we're on social media. If you want to follow what's going on, uh, CMS Experiment, Atlas Experiment, and CERN are all uh, Twitter tags and Facebook and Google and everything you want, we're, we're out there. Um, and uh, we're looking at a lot of different ways uh, to keep you informed of what's going on. Uh, Dave and I recently at this, um, at this conference we were at in Australia, we tried something new. Uh, we just learned about Google Hangouts uh, a few yeah. months beforehand, and we loved it. We loved the idea that we can sit here and talk to people and uh, have a conversation like this. And so we tried out. We just impromptu put on a, a question and answer session, and people really liked it a lot. So I think you know we're all going to look into doing this. Yeah. Maybe Nick sure. would like to be involved in that yeah, periodically. I, I got uh, involved by this gentleman here. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the accelerator and, uh, and the details of building machines or uh, limits so, of technology in machines, etc. So, yeah, it's great fun to, to talk to young people to, to make them understand or at least try to show yeah. the complexity of all these issues and uh, why and how of where physics is going in this fundamental sense, mm -hmm. maybe. And by, by young people, you're referring to... to uh, uh, of yeah, course, yeah, I mean yeah, young yeah. people like you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in, in the end, our... Our end product is knowledge, and you know part of our job is to make sure that that knowledge isn't just kept by a few people in an ivory tower somewhere. It, it, it's your knowledge as well. So the reason we're we being the people here at CERN are doing this is for you, 
uh, and it will only advance when you take over from us. So we're looking forward to you guys, uh, younger than even me That's and Steve, right, yeah. <laughs> come to CERN and take our jobs yep. away from us. That's right. Yep. And push the field even further. And show interest. In some yeah. And we're always happy to try and help in That's some right, way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're yep. we an open lab. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Come and visit us. Come and visit us. Yeah, yeah indeed. Lots Fantastic. Well, um, thank you, all three of you. Thank you uh, to Steve and to, to Nick and to Dave. Um, thank you for taking the time to, to really uh, kind of approach the, the, the technology and the science behind it um, and make it kind of approachable for us watching. Um, there are also makers in the community um, who are helping to develop some of these sciences um, and technologies to kind of bring it uh, into your kind of your backyard shop. Um, one of those is, is Ben um, Krasnow. He couldn't unfortunately join us during this hangout, um, but we'll be having a hangout afterwards. He developed his own scanning electron uh, microscope, so we'll have a special hangout with Ben um, starting at 10 o'clock um, today. Uh, excuse me, tomorrow, Saturday. Um, but thank you again to the team from CERN. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us today for Maker Camp, uh, and we'll also be putting up a promo code um, for the uh, Make 31 volume, uh, the, the Punk Science. Uh, Fitting little theme, um, so campers and uh, and certain alike, uh, look for the promo code under this uh, hangout and uh, get your uh, get your copy uh, discount for this weekend. Um, and again, thank you, Eric and Jillian, for asking those awesome questions and taking from the campers. And we will uh, see you today for a, a second follow up hangout at twelve o'clock uh, with a cool shop that's making some electric cars. Um, so thanks again, to everyone, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks so much. Bye. This was great. Bye. 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 Bye.